Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Vlies from Central New Mexico Community College. We're going to cover the autonomic nervous system in this presentation. The autonomic nervous system gets several synonyms. You will very often hear it being referred to as the visceral nervous system, also the involuntary nervous system, and less commonly the vegetative nervous system. It is a nervous system that operates completely subconsciously, so we're not aware of it operating. And most of the control originates from the brainstem with the hypothalamus functioning as the supervisor of the brainstem. And when it does this, its main function is to maintain homeostasis. Now, pretty much everything in anatomy and physiology relates to maintaining homeostasis, but the two divisions that make up the, the autonomic nervous system, you're already familiar with them, that is the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, they work together in a fashion to where they manage to maintain homeostasis in all those different viscera that we find in our thoracic cavity, such as the lungs and the heart, and in the, the abdominal pelvic cavity. You'll be talking a lot about the autonomic nervous system in anatomy and physiology too when you study all of these viscera which mostly have smooth muscle in their walls because many of these organs are hollow organs. Um, of course, the heart is also a hollow organ except that its wall is made up of cardiac muscle tissue. And then let's not forget that the effectors of the autonomic nervous system also include the glands. So you'll see that your book or I myself might be talking about the effectors or the targets or even the target effectors of the autonomic nervous system. The final thing to mention is, or to explain I should say, is the name autonomic. And notice it's autonomic, it's not automatic as some students confuse it with sometimes. Um, auto, as you know, means self. And NOM refers to or translates into self-governing. So it's a self-governing -gov uh, nervous system in the sense that this is an, a motor division that actually has ganglia. And remember, anytime there are ganglia, that means that there are lots of cell bodies. And in this case, these cell bodies are actually synapsing with neurons. And I'll show you this in, in just a moment. So anytime we have synapses in ganglia outside of the central nervous system, we're seeing integration occurring outside of the central nervous system. And so this is what the autonomic nervous system is capable of doing, some level of integration outside of the CNS. And from there it's named autonomic. I already mentioned that we do not have any conscious control over the workings of the autonomic nervous system. So regulation of our viscera with the help of the autonomic nervous system arises from our brainstem, that is the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And of course it is the hypothalamus that supervises the brainstem. Now the hypothalamus in its turn is going to receive input from all kinds of structures that are part of the limbic system. Remember, that is our emotional brain. And you may have noticed that sometimes our emotions affect our viscera. It may, we may have an upset digestion uh, because of how we emo feel emotionally. And then we see that um, fibers project from the, the hypothalamus, as I said, into the brainstem, where we have the reticular formation system located as well. And then we also see uh, that fibers go down into the spinal cord, where uh, autonomic motor fibers can arise as well, as we'll see on the next few slides. Much more on the involvement of the brain um, onto the on the, or the effects of the brain, I should say, on the autonomic nervous system um, in AMP2. As you know already, our autonomic nervous system is made up of the sympathetic and parasympathetic division, or you can just call them nervous systems. We'll start here with saying a few words about the sympathetic division, and then we'll do something analogous for the parasympathetic division.
Remember that the sympathetic division can also be called your fight or flight nervous system. And this is because this is the nervous system that tends to predominate when we need to fight for our lives or flee for our lives or we're angry or we're very upset about something or we're exercising vigorously um, or we're, we're emotionally distressed. And typically what's going to happen is a series of changes in our body that you're pretty familiar with. For instance, your heart rate goes up, your breathing goes up, you're starting to sweat, your pupils might dilate. If you're in a situation where you're really scared, let's say you think a bear is after you, you might even get very uh, acute smell, you might have very good hearing, um, your eyes are very alert, all those special sensory organs become very, very acute. Your muscles feel tense because blood is very much diverted to your skeletal muscles, of course your heart as well, but your skeletal muscles in the event that you need to fight or flee for your life, or even when you're exercising, all of the, these things happen. And a lot of this is, a, is as a result of adrenaline, also called epinephrine, being released into your bloodstream, which we will talk more about in just a moment. What's not going to happen during the time of your sympathetic nervous system is that you, your organ systems, such as your digestion and um, your urinary systems, are not really going to be functioning much at all because blood is going to be diverted away uh, from these systems. There's no point in starting to digest your food or starting to um, form urine during these times of stress. That's not to say that in severe, severe stress, people might not defecate on themselves or urinate themselves. And this is poorly understood why this happens. Um, it might be because the system, the sympathetic nervous system is in such overdrive that the body just essentially goes into shock and therefore uh, we see the resulting defecation and urination. In summary, what we find is that the functions of the sympathetic division um, relate to exercise, excitement, emergency, and embarrassment. Don't forget embarrassment as well. So once you understand what the functions are of the sympathetic division, it's easy to come up with the functions of the parasympathetic division because they're pretty much the opposite. In other words, we're going to see a slowing down of the heart rate, a slowing down of the respiratory rate. We're not going to see sweating. We're not going to see dilated pupils. We're not going to have you know, ex ex excellent smell at this point in time. We're not going to feel all tensed uh, because our our skeletal muscles are receiving all this blood and, and are ready to start contracting vigorously in an attempt to fight or flee or something along those lines. Instead, what the parasympathetic nervous system primarily focuses on is the conservation and the restoration of energy reserves. And it does that especially by means of digestion. So when the parasympath, or I should say, when your stomach is contracting and your your digestive glands are secreting and your liver is busy, those are all functions of your parasympathetic nervous system, <clears throat> including defecation and diuresis. Diuresis is just a fancy way of referring to uh, the formation of urine and, and urinating. I should just say urinating, really. So really, if you think about it, all these functions tend to occur when we've had a really nice, good meal. So this is a good way of remembering uh, what happens when the parasympathetic nervous system predominates. Just put yourself in a position after you've had a nice, good meal. For the next few slides, we're going to focus on the anatomy of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. This is a slide that's focusing on the anatomy of the sympathetic nervous system, but the first couple of things I'm going to mention actually apply to both systems. That is, they apply to the whole autonomic nervous system. And that is that unlike the somatic nervous system, where we saw 
one motor neuron leaving from the central nervous system and then making it to its effector, which was, of course, the skeletal muscle. Actually, why don't I just draw that? Of course, its cell body would be located here with its dendrites, and then its axon would be here to where we finally would get the, to the axonal terminals that would synapse with some kind of a skeletal muscle. So this would be one somatic motor neuron making it to skeletal muscle. It's not that way in the autonomic nervous system. In the autonomic nervous system, we will see that the cell body starts in the gray matter of the central nervous system. And in the case of the spinal cord, it would be the lateral horn primarily. There would be one motor neuron, a synapsis with the cell body of another motor neuron before we'd reach the effector, the effector being the heart, smooth muscle, or glands. So we have two neurons in a row. Consequently, we form a ganglion here, remember collection of cell bodies, outside of the CNS. And consequently, we refer to our first motor neuron. Remember, we're leaving the CNS, therefore it's a motor neuron or efferent neuron. That first motor neuron we call the preganglionic neuron because it sits prior or pre the ganglion. While we refer to this motor neuron that sits posterior to the ganglion as the postganglionic or often also just called the ganglionic neuron. I prefer to call it the postganglionic neuron. I think you guys can follow better when I use that terminology. So that's um, information that applies to both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Let's now focus on just the sympathetic nervous system and um, allow me first off to point out to you that in this diagram, which comes out of the OpenStax book, um, there was in my edition an error where the dorsal root ganglion was pointed to incorrectly here. Of course, this right here is your dorsal root ganglion. I'm sure you guys figured that out. This is another sympathetic nervous system ganglion, just like this one. Uh, there's a series of ganglia that run up and down along the length of the vertebral column in the sympathetic nervous system that we'll get to in just a second. So, in the sympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic neuron often gets the synonym of central neuron. So this very first neuron in the sympathetic nervous system is very often called the central neuron. We're going to find that sympathetic preganglionic neurons only originate from the spinal cord. And in a particular area of the spinal cord, and that is in the thoracic and lumbar lateral horns of the spinal cord only. Remember, the lateral horn is only present in certain parts of the spinal cord, and that is because only certain parts of the spinal cord give rise to autonomic fibers. So the thoracic and the lumbar region of the spinal cord are areas where sympathetic preganglionic fibers arise. So that's one piece of information. We're going to see that many of these axons that leave, or neurons have axons that leave the spinal cord. Um, these axons are myelinated, and they're going to become part of a structure right here where we branch off um, our spinal nerve that forms there. And this little structure here is a short interconnecting nerve that we call the white ramus communicans the white ramus communicans. And like I said, it'll, be, um, it'll contain myelinated axons of these preganglionic uh, fibers primarily. The plural for ramus communicans is rami communicantes. So these rami communicantes are on their way to the ganglion of the sympathetic nervous system. On the other hand, the, the neurons, or I'm sorry, the axons of the postganglionic neurons, they're going to be unmyelinated or mostly unmyelinated. And so this nerve branch that is on its way to the target effectors 
is referred to as the gray ramus communicans. So the white ramus communicans and the gray ramus communicans are two structures that are very characteristic for the sympathetic nervous system. Just be aware of that. There are important differences, anatomical differences, between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And this diagram clearly demonstrates how all preganglionic fibers, which are illustrated in the dark red of the sympathetic nervous system, they all originate from the spinal cord, and more specifically from the thoracic and lumbar area of the spinal cord. We do not see any sympathetic fibers arising from the brain stem. That's not to say that postganglionic fibers, which you see illustrated in the dotted lines, will not reach structures in the head all the way to our eyes. And that is because many of the preganglionic fibers will synapse with a postsynaptic neuron in a ganglion that um, is more superior, for instance, in the spinal cord, which then can send postganglionic fibers uh, that are superior to the spinal cord even. And so we see that there are these change of cha there is a chain of ganglia along the length of the vertebral column on either side. I should say everything, of course, always occurs in pairs. So all of these structures that you see on this side, you would see on the other side of the vertebral column as well. Um, but we see a very clear chain of ganglia sympathetic ganglia parallel on either side or parallel to either side of the vertebral column. In addition, there are also some ganglia that sit anterior to the vertebral column. And of course, that's difficult to illustrate here, but um, your book just illustrates them on the side here. So for instance, this one, the celiac ganglion, is one of those examples. You see another one here and here. So if the ganglion is part of this chain, we refer to the ganglion as a chain ganglion, a sympathetic chain ganglion, or a paravertebral ganglion, para spelled as in P-A-R-A. -A. I have this all spelled out for you on the next slide. On the other hand, these guys that sit anterior to the vertebral column we refer to them as pre-vertebral ganglia. And they have several synonyms, by the way, um, these ganglia. Notice, too, that for the most part, we see that the sympathetic ganglia sit quite close to the central nervous system. Um, even your pre-vertebral ganglia, which sits on the anterior side, they're going to be close to the central nervous system and far away from their effectors. So that is yet another anatomical difference that we will see with as we compare the location of the, these, the ganglia with the sympathetic nervous system. So here then is a text slide that focuses on these ganglia of the sympathetic nervous system. And they are always going to be located close to the central nervous system. Of course, this would be the spinal cord. Now, on either side, along the length of the vertebral column, we have the chain ganglia, or better called the right and left sympathetic chain ganglia, which you can also call the sympathetic trunk ganglia, or very often called the paravertebral ganglia. Uh, and there's quite a few of them. And then we have those ganglia that sit anterior to the vertebral column. I prefer to call them the prevertebral ganglia, but they can also be called the collateral ganglia. And they are especially going to uh, be the ganglia where the postganglionic neurons arise that control the viscera of the abdominal cavity in particular. The other thing to mention is that some of these postganglionic neurons, 
um, I'm sorry, some of the uh, axons of the preganglionic neurons, also called the central neurons, are going to form what we call the splanchnic nerves. If you go back to the previous diagram, you see the splanchnic nerves labeled. So So just like the parasympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system has preganglionic and postganglionic neurons. And the preganglionic neuron in the sympathetic nervous system is often referred to as the central neuron. Now there are different ways in which the central neuron can synapse with its postganglionic neuron. So let's take a look at that. So this only applies now to the sympathetic nervous system. In the first scenario, our preganglionic neuron or central neuron will synapse pretty much at the level um, of where it originates. So the ganglion where it synapses is pretty much at the same level where the preganglionic uh, uh, neuron originates and to then, um, for then the postganglionic neuron to reach its target effector. In the second scenario, it is possible for the central neuron or preganglionic neuron to not synapse in the closest uh, chain ganglion, but move upwards or even downwards along the chain of ganglia. And here we see it um, synapsing in the ganglion higher up with its postganglionic neuron. Also, remember, we have another set of ganglia. These right here, the ones I'm pointing now, pointing to now are the paravertebral or the, the, the sympathetic chain ganglia. But you have also some that sit anterior to the length of the vertebral column, better referred to as the prevertebral ganglia. So in our third scenario, what we see is that our preganglionic sympathetic neuron is not going to synapse in a trunk ganglion, but instead will synapse in a prevertebral ganglion uh, with its postganglionic neuron. There's actually a fourth scenario, and in that case, the preganglionic neuron is going to synapse with modified postganglionic neurons in the adrenal medulla, which uh, is not illustrated here, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment in more detail. Um, those cells inside of the adrenal gland, in the inner region of the adrenal gland called the adrenal medulla, those cells are called chromaffin cells. So the parasympathetic nervous system is structurally quite different from the a sympathetic nervous system when it comes to its origin. The origin of the parasympathetic fibers are going to be from the brain stem. As you can see here, all of these dark blue lines represent the preganglionic pre neurons of parasympathetic fibers, but we also see a sacral origin from the spinal cord. So we have a cranial origin from the brain and a sacral origin from the spinal cord. Notice too that we don't have really well developed ganglia. I mean, we do have ganglia, but um, they are typically going to be located um, really close to the viscera or very often inside of the viscera. So we don't see the very well developed ganglionic structures such as this whole chain that we saw in the sympathetic nervous system. Now, because we have or origins of preganglionic neurons of the parasympathetic nervous system from the brain, clearly there are some cranial nerves with parasympathetic origins. And be sure you know which cranial nerves these are. 
And remember, all your nerves are, occur in pairs as well. So we have the pair of oculomotor nerves, facial nerves, glossopharyngeal, and vagus nerves, all with parasympathetic fibers in them. We do tend to refer to the ganglia of the parasympathetic nervous system as the terminal ganglia, and that, ter that term alone tells you that these are ganglia that sit close to their termination or destination. We don't really give the preganglionic neurons a unique name. Um, again, the postganglionic neurons are uh, often referred to as ganglionic neurons, also in the parasympathetic nervous system. So this chart gives you a nice summary of your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Remember, your sympathetic nervous system has um, origins from the thoracic and lumbar part of the spinal cord. So very often, instead of it being called the sympathetic nervous system, it'll be called the thoracolumbar nervous system. Different doctors in different specialties might prefer the term sympathetic versus thoracolumbar. Similarly, we see that the parasympathetic nervous system is also referred to as craniosacral because it originates from the brain as well as the sacral region. Your parasympathetic fibers have long preganglionic fibers and short postganglionic fibers and just the opposite for the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system has its ganglia close to the uh, spinal cord where they um, originate or where the, the sympathetic nervous system originate while the parasympathetic fi uh, this nervous system has its ganglia either inside of the actual effectors or nearby. One of the very important things you're going to have to learn in the autonomic nervous system as well as the somatic nervous system is the different kinds of receptors that are present. Now, you've already learned that the somatic nervous system consists of a somatic motor neuron, a single somatic motor neuron with its cell body inside of the gray matter of the central nervous system. An axon that is heavily myelinated and axonal terminals that release these little red dots which correspond to this legend and that is acetylcholine. And the effector of all somatic motor neurons is always skeletal muscle. Notice that axons, axonal terminals, all are located in the PNS. Now, your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system may have two, if not three, different kinds of neurotransmitters, and that is acetylcholine and norepinephrine, and in some cases also epinephrine. And so in all of my slides, you'll see the abbreviation NE and E capital letters, which are the abbreviations for norepinephrine and epinephrine. Remember that norepinephrine is the same thing as noradrenaline, and that uh, epinephrine is the same thing as adrenaline. It depends on which country you're in or which book you pick up that um, either epinephrine or adrenaline is preferred. It doesn't matter, really. So why is it so important to know which neurotransmitters are released where, by which fibers, and what kinds of receptors are present? So notice that you see different colors here in the somatic um, nervous system versus in the autonomic nervous system. And of course, in the autonomic nervous system, we have two neurons in a row. Our preganglionic neurons, which have their origin inside of the CNS, spinal cord or brain, parasympathetic nervous system might be in the brain, and the postganglionic neurons, which start in an a ganglion that is outside of the CNS. Now, I need to add one more thing for the sympathetic nervous system. 
And then I will try to explain to you why it's so important for you to know which fibers secrete which neurotransmitter. So some sympathetic fibers, so some, some, some sympathetic preganglionic fibers, I should say, are not going to synapse with traditional postganglionic neurons. Instead, they send their axonal terminals to a gland, and this is a gland that sits right on top of each one of your kidneys. So if I make a quick little sketch here of our kidney, maybe right, right here, a kidney is kind of bean shaped like so, um, sitting on top of the kidney kind of like, like a little hat like so is the adrenal gland. And the very inner side of the adrenal gland, I'll show this in the red here, that would be where the adrenal medulla region is located. Remember that medulla always refers to the core of an organ. Well, think of the adrenal medulla uh, as a bunch of modified postganglionic fibers, these guys modified and jam-packed into the adrenal medulla area. Do that and you will be set. All right, if you can kind of visualize that, it'll make it much easier for you to understand um, how this part of the sympathetic nervous system works. We do give these modified cells here inside of the adrenal medulla a special name. You notice that I mentioned the chromaffin cells earlier, so that is what we call them. And they have secretory capacity still. And interestingly enough, they don't just secrete what the typical sympathetic neurons, um, postganglionic neurons secrete, that is norepinephrine, they also secrete epinephrine. So these chromaffin cells also secrete epinephrine in addition to norepinephrine. Now, where does the norepinephrine and epinephrine get secreted into? Well, it gets secreted into the bloodstream. And so because these are neurotransmitters that are also being secreted into the bloodstream, um, they're by definition also considered to be hormones. As a matter of fact, you probably mostly think of um, adrenaline and noradrenaline as hormones. And then via the blood, these two hormones slash neurotransmitters can then make it to all of the effectors of the autonomic nervous system, or I should say the sympathetic nervous system as listed here. Okay, so that said, so clearly this is a chart with a lot of information. Um, it shows the length of the fibers of each one of our neurons. It shows our effectors. It shows which neurotransmitters are released. It shows the location of the ganglia, etc., etc. So why is it so important for us to know all this information along with neurotransmitters and receptors? Well, a lot of medications, a lot of drugs are going to be able to impact the receptors on the effectors and sometimes even in the ganglia, but especially the effectors in order to treat a person with a particular symptom. So for instance, remember that all hollow organs have smooth muscle in them and that includes blood vessels. So if we can control the size of the diameter of blood vessels by controlling the smooth muscle in the blood vessels, we can also control blood pressure. Clearly, is if, a, if blood vessels constrict, they're going to increase the blood pressure. If blood vessels uh, dilate, as in vasodilation, blood pressure comes down. So you can see that we are, it's, it's of great interest to medicine to have a good understanding of what kinds of receptors are present on the effectors in an attempt to treat patients. In order to prepare us to better understand these receptors, we're going to classify those, post, those axons that secrete um, acetylcholine, 
into a group versus those axons that secrete norepinephrine. And then we'll talk about the receptors. So we have acetylcholine releasing axons or fibers and we call them cholinergic. If you go back to the chart, you will see that actually all preganglionic axons of all of the autonomic nervous system produce acetylcholine. All postganglionic parasympathetic fibers produce acetylcholine. And then, of course, we find that our um, um, skeletal muscles always receive um, uh, acetylcholine. And so I just noticed that I didn't add this on this slide, but we must add that all somatic motor neurons are also cholinergic. Right, because they secrete acetylcholine as well. Now, our sympathetic nervous system has some exceptions, and that is some postganglionic sympathetic fibers do not secrete norepinephrine and instead secrete acetylcholine. These are fibers that are innervating sweat glands, the blood vessels of skeletal muscles, as well as external genitalia. So be sure you're aware of the fact that there are some postganglionic sympathetic fibers that do not secrete norepinephrine. All fibers that secrete norepinephrine, we refer to as adrenergic. Of course, that term stems from adrenaline. And those are all your sympathetic, or those are most, I should say, of your sympathetic postganglionic axons. Because remember, there are some that are an exception to that rule. Now, along those lines, we have receptors with similar names. We have cholinergic receptors that bind acetylcholine and adrenergic receptors that bind norepinephrine. Within the cholinergic receptors, we actually have two classes, the nicotinic and the muscarinic receptors. Within the adrenergic receptors, we also have two classes, alpha and beta receptors. In these classes of receptors, by the way, there are lots of subclasses. For instance, there is alpha-1 and alpha-2 and beta-1 and beta-2, etc., etc., that is a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Just as a reminder, some of the um, preganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system are going to go straight to the adrenal medulla. And they do this through these splanchnic nerves I've mentioned earlier. And then inside of the adrenal medulla, we have the chromaffin cells that secrete the norepinephrine and epinephrine into the bloodstream. The second thing to remind you of is that some sympathetic fibers, postganglionic fibers, do not secrete norepinephrine and instead secrete acetylcholine. And these are the um, effectors, the sweat glands, blood vessels, and skeletal muscles and external genitalia that you should memorize. In this diagram, I have labeled the, the postsynaptic membranes with their receptors. So the letters, the letter N, I should say, represents nicotinic. A nicotinic receptor is a class of cholinergic receptors. In other words, it is a receptor that binds acetylcholine. M stands for muscarinic receptors. Muscarinic receptors are the second class of acetylcholine types of receptors, better called cholinergic receptors. And then the letter A stands for adrenergic receptors. Maybe we should start with the easy part, and that is that all effectors, or that I should say the majority of the effectors of the sympathetic nervous system are going to be, are going to have adrenergic receptors. Um, so those postganglionic fibers that release norepinephrine in the case of the sympathetic nervous system are going to innervate effectors that have uh, receptors that bind norepinephrine because postganglionic sympathetic fibers release norepinephrine. 
There are some exceptions, as you know. Some of these postganglionic fibers release acetylcholine, and when they do, their effectors will actually have muscarinic effectors. We also see that all of the effectors of the parasympathetic nervous system have muscarinic effectors, and therefore everything else will have a nicotinic receptor. Now let's look for a pattern here and notice that all the postganglionic membranes essentially will have nicotinic receptors, including the chromaffin cells. Think of them again as a postsynaptic cell. Even the skeletal muscle cells have nicotinic receptors. And remember, when acetylcholine binds to, to, a, to its receptors on skeletal muscles, the result was always excitatory. In other words, when acetylcholine binds to its skeletal muscle receptors, we found that depolarization always occurred. So nicotinic receptors are always going to be excitatory. So I'm going to put pluses here to imply that these are always excitatory. So anywhere where we have a nicotinic receptor, we're going to see that depolarization occurs. The muscarinic receptors can be either. We might see either um, excitation or um, inhibition or depolarization or inhibition. So it really varies on where we are in the body, which organ we're dealing with, whether the binding of acetylcholine to the muscarinic receptors will lead to depolarization or hyperpolarization. So here you see acetylcholine in the autonomic nervous system can actually cause hyperpolarization, which we haven't really uh, or hadn't really talked about. And um, with the help of a text slide, we'll talk more about the effects of the adrenergic receptors. So here is a text slide summarizing what I just said. So we have two kinds of cholinergic receptors. We have receptors that are called nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. Both of them bind acetylcholine. Now, why do they get these names? Well, researchers found that when they, when they placed nicotine in a synapsis where acetylcholine is present, sometimes the nicotine would bind to the acetylcholine receptors. They also found that when they placed the muscarine chemical, which is a mushroom poison, in a synapsis where normally acetylcholine is released, that in some places, muscarine would bind with the acetylcholine receptors. Interestingly, though, we did not see recept we did not see nicotinic receptors occurring in the same place as where muscarinic receptors occurred. So if you go back to the previous chart, you will see that a postsynaptic membrane will either have nicotinic or muscarinic cholinergic receptors. Try to memorize that. Nicotinic receptors are found on skeletal muscles because you're very familiar with that system. You know that when acetylcholine binds to skeletal muscles, the effect is depolarization or excitation or stimulation. And it's very fast because the ion channels are cation channels that are chemically gated. Uh, there's no delay. There's an instant opening of those channels. And we already listed where these different nicotinic receptors are located. When acetylcholine binds to its muscarinic receptors, the effect can either be inhibitory, meaning hyperpolarization, or excitatory, meaning depolarization. The effect is a little bit slower because the receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. In other words, they're not ionotropic, they're metabotropic types of receptors. And so 
Whenever there is the, this intermediary of a G protein, it takes a bit longer. And again, we are, have already mentioned where all of these muscarinic receptors are located. One more time, remember that there are some sympathetic postganglionic fibers that secrete acetylcholine, and they have these, um, and, and their effectors have these muscarinic receptors, their effectors being your sweat glands, blood vessels, and skeletal muscles, and external genitalia. If we now look at the adrenergic receptors, we find that they are all G-protein coupled receptors, so all of them are meta metabotropic, so they're going to all respond a little bit slower than the nicotinic receptors. Remember, the two classes of adrenergic receptors are alpha receptors and beta receptors. In general, or most of the time, and I can't stress this enough that I'm saying most of the time, we see that when norepinephrine binds with alpha receptors, the result is stimulatory or depolarization. On the other hand, when norepinephrine binds to beta receptors, most of the time the result is inhibitory. Let's come back to norepinephrine binding to alpha receptors, and in general, as I said, depolarization will occur. So we find norepinephrine receptors, better called alpha receptors, on blood vessel, in blood vessel walls, in the smooth muscle of blood vessel walls. And as I mentioned earlier, if we allow for norepinephrine to bind to these smooth muscle, then they will contract and cause vasoconstriction, meaning the blood vessels will narrow di their diameter and that increases blood pressure. Um, when norepinephrine does not bind or less of it binds, we're going to see vasodilation and our blood pressure comes down. And that's how our body regulates our blood pressure. Clearly, some people are not regulating quite as well as they should, and they suffer from too high a blood pressure consistently. They suffer from something called hypertension. So very often you'll hear that these people, your patients in the future, might be prescribed a drug called an alpha blocker. And the alpha relates or refers, I should say, to the alpha adrenergic receptor. So if we block them with a drug preventing the binding of norepinephrine, then there's less of a chance that the smooth muscle in the walls of the blood vessels will contract too much. And consequently, we will see that the blood pressure will come down in these patients. Now, normally we see that when norepinephrine binds to beta receptors, we see hyperpolarization. Um, but in the heart, it's backwards. So in the heart, what we see is that when norepinephrine binds to its beta receptor, we see depolarization occurring. And of course, that ultimately leads to contraction of the heart or the heart pumping, right? Contraction of the heart is similar to the pumping of the heart. Now, people whose heart pumps too fast, in other words, they have too high of a heart rate, and we call that condition tachycardia, literally meaning too fast of a heartbeat, we give them beta blockers. Because if we block the binding of norepinephrine to the beta receptors, depolarization cannot occur, and therefore the heart cannot contract as much, and the heart rate comes down. So often, people who suffer from tachycardia are placed on beta blockers. I'd like for you to be familiar with these two kinds of drugs for your final exam. And this is just the beginning of you learning how important it is for you to have an understanding of these different receptors. Later on, you will be taking courses in your professional program, whether it's nursing, pharmacy assistant, sonography, etc., etc., where you will probably learn more and more about the impact of drugs. Uh, 
many of you, I know not all of you, will end up taking pharmacology and this, this topic of the autonomic nervous system with all the various receptors and, and neurotransmitters is a very important component of pharmacology. We're done with the hardest part of this topic on the autonomic nervous system. There's just a few uh, smaller topics to still discuss. One of them being the um, places where neurotransmitters are released from. In the somatic motor neurons, we see very distinct axonal terminals. Well, we don't have such distinct axonal terminals in the autonomic nervous system. Instead, what we see is that um, as the axon starts to give off little branches, um, these little branches are not going to terminate in axonal terminals, but they're going to have along their lengths little swellings. And you see one enlarged right here. And one of these little swellings is called a varicosity. Like varicose veins, which are swollen veins, a varicosity is a little swelling along the length of um, a little axon uh, terminal branch. And what's also interesting and different here from a typical neuromuscular junction with a skeletal muscle cell is that these varicosities kind of are distributed throughout the smooth muscle cells, or it could be in cardiac muscle tissue too. And there is no very specific um, area where, or I should say there's no very specific synapses between one varicosity and one muscle cell. In other words, for instance, this varicosity, when it releases its neurotransmitters, these neurotransmitters are going to go to various cells, not just this cell, but also a cell next door and a next, next door over here and possibly even further. And you can see that maybe you can visualize that better here on the left hand image. And this is because communication can occur between the smooth muscle cells and even cardiac muscle cells. Um, they are not electrically isolated like the skeletal muscles are. So smooth muscle and cardiac muscle cells um, are electrically connected. Not all smooth muscle cells, but the majority of them are. So if one smooth muscle cell becomes either depolarized or hyperpolarized due to the binding of a neurotransmitter, that electrical signal can be passed on to the next cell without that cell, without that muscle cell receiving any neurotransmitters. So this is one of the big differences um, with skeletal muscle. Something else to point out is um, the fact that our sympathetic nervous system has a very systemic effect. And let's explain what we mean by that, which is different from our parasympathetic nervous system, which has a more localized effect. So the sympathetic nervous system has a systemic and also long effect. Let's put long in the title if, as, as well. Let's take a look at what we mean by that. If we study the anatomy again of the sympathetic nervous system, what we see is that it has per-preganglionic neurons. So let's say that this here represents the preganglionic neuron. Typically, it's going to have quite a few, if not, I should say, many post-ganglionic neurons. And these are going to go to many different effectors very often as well. So clearly, if a signal starts from our central neuron or preganglionic neuron in the sympathetic nervous system, it could impact one, two, three in my diagram, effectors if not more. In other words, we are going to see that the sympathetic nervous system can affect a good part if not all of the body. From there, the term systemic. So that is an anatomical explanation. There are also physiological reasons, and that is that norepinephrine is not inactivated very quickly. It depends on a transporter protein. It may even depend on just diffusion away from the synapses. 
which is very different from acetylcholine esterase. Remember acetylcholine, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I just gave away the answer. Remember that acetylcholine is destroyed or inactivated by means of acetylcholine esterase. And that occurs really fast. That enzyme is always there. It is also, um, norepinephrine is also slower acting because it, it, it works through a G-coupled um, or a second messenger system rather than the way acetylcholine typically functions through, um, through a much faster reacting um, ion gate or receptor. And then let's not forget, this is probably the most important one, that both norepinephrine and epinephrine are dumped into the blood by those chromaffin cells of the medulla, the adrenal medulla. And as you know, anytime something ends up into the bloodstream, that's going to end up going everywhere in the body. So these are the various reasons, not just anatomical reasons, but also physiological reasons for why our sympathetic nervous system has a systemic as, a, as well as a long effect. Let me give you an example of this. All of you are probably studying for your final exams that are coming up. Your body is under a lot of stress right now. And chances are very good that when you're done with your last final, which you cannot wait for, to, for it to be over with, that when you're driving home or walking home or riding your bike home from that very last final, you sit in your car and go, I don't care about the kids. I don't care about the significant other. I want to sleep for two days solid. And let's assume that you can do that. Let's assume that you have a chance to lie down and take a long nap. Chances are also very high that you're not going to be able to sleep right away. Or let's say you've gone out to a party, you went out with your friends and danced for a long time and had a really good time, and, or you worked out late at night, you're having a really hard time sleeping afterwards because of all of these reasons that we have listed here on this slide. So you have a long coming down period when your sympathetic division has been predominating for a, a while due to stress. And so our parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, has a more localized effect uh, that is shorter lasting or short lived. And that is because we have only some postganglionic fibers per preganglionic fiber. And then don't forget all of the parasympathetic fibers, every one of them, all the preganglionic and the postganglionic fibers, they secrete acetylcholine. And you know that acetylcholine is very easily destroyed by acetylcholine esterase. So therefore, its effects are short-lived. Now we need to say a few more, more words about reflexes. In the section on or in the topic on the peripheral nervous system and a little bit in the spinal cord topic you learned about reflexes particularly somatic reflexes in the peripheral nervous system um, topic we learned about the patellar reflex which was um, the reflex that occurs when a doctor hits you on the patellar ligament and you extend at the knee that includes a somatic motor neuron but there are all kinds of reflexes, and you will study the, these in great detail, that involve your um, viscera. Your heart rate is all controlled by means of reflexes. If your heart rate is going, starting to go up too much, you're going to see that a reflex kicks in that brings it back down. If your blood pressure goes up, there's a reflex that brings it back down. Of course, this is under non-stressful situations. Um, there are reflexes that deal with digestion, etc. There are reflexes that are involved, autonomic reflexes that are involved with urination. The list is endless, and as I said, you will study these in AMP2 in great detail. But for this class, you definitely need to know the anatomical difference between a somatic and a visceral reflex. And 
these two images, and I'm sorry that the resolution is kind of low because I blew them up so much, um, but these two images are not including our sensory neuron. Okay, so we're only focusing on the motor output. It's very easy to always pick out which one is the somatic and which one is the autonomic reflex, even if you do not see the effector shown. And of course, it is because of the number of motor neurons involved. In the case of a somatic reflex, we would see that a sensory neuron would synapse either directly with a somatic motor neuron or first with an interneuron and then the somatic motor neuron, which is heavily myelinated and innervates skeletal muscle cells. Now, even if we didn't see the skeletal muscle cell here, we would still be able to identify this as being part of a somatic reflex because we just see one heavily myelinated somatic motor neuron. And it's also um, leaving through the ventral horn and making it to the effector. On the other hand, a visceral reflex will consist of a visceral sensory neuron that brings the information in via the dorsal root, like any sensory neuron. There will always be a synapsis with at least an interneuron, so all visceral reflexes are multisynaptic. And then we see, as you know by now, a preganglionic neuron followed by a postganglionic neuron making it to its effector. So the fact that we have two neurons in a row usually with just one of the two being somewhat myelinated, is indicative that we're dealing with a visceral reflex. I'd like for you to read a little bit in your book or on, on online, perhaps Wikipedia, about referred pain. As you know very well, when a person has a heart attack, they're not going to be aching right in the point or at the point where their heart is located. They tend to hurt all the way down their arm, even often um, on, on their back. And even there's even sexual differences, or I should say gender differences, in where one aches during a heart attack. And why is that? Well, it's not 100% understood, but it's thought that visceral sensory neurons and somatic sensory neurons, because they tend to take the same pathway, um, therefore, we get confused. So a visceral sensory neuron is along the same pathway as a somatic sensory neuron. So we interpret a visceral problem as a form of somatic pain. So read a little bit about this. And take a look at this chart if you ever have any serious pain anywhere, because it could be a reflection of a visceral symptom. We're going to just very briefly discuss this slide. I earlier discussed the difference between a somatic reflex and a visceral reflex, and um, you're already familiar with the fact that we have different ways of classifying reflexes. Reflexes can be integrated at the level of the spinal cord or the brain, so we talk about spinal and cranial reflexes. They can be called visceral or somatic, monosynaptic, polysynaptic, etc., etc. One thing that you, we haven't discussed and we'll not, we're not going to discuss any further except for this slide is the fact that sometimes reflexes that deal with your viscera in particular do not include the central nervous system. You may have heard, and your book mentions it, of the enteric nervous system. I haven't mentioned it much, but you will in AMP2, enteric referring to the digestive system. It is this, um, it's sort of a branch of the autonomic nervous system, you could almost say. It's this particular enteric nervous system in which the so-called short reflexes often occur. Short reflexes, what are they? What do you need to know? they do not include the CNS. There's direct stimulation of the postganglionic neurons um, onto the, to, uh, of the viscera. 
On the other hand, a long reflex, which is what you have been introduced to primarily in this class, always includes the CNS. So that's the main difference, the exclusion of the CNS in the case of a short reflex. Most viscera in our body are characterized by dual innervation. And by dual innervation, we mean that a organ, a viscera, is innervated by both the sympathetic as well as the parasympathetic nervous system. Your heart is a very good example of that. Your heart receives both sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers. The sympathetic fibers speed up the heart, the parasympathetic fibers slow down the heart. Same with your many of your digestive structures. Your sympathetic nervous system is going to slow down um, contraction of the stomach while your parasympathetic nervous system will increase contraction of the stomach because remember the parasympathetic nervous system is your resting and digesting nervous system. Bear in mind though that there are some structures in the body that do not receive parasympathetic fibers and they only receive sympathetic fibers and most of our blood vessels our sweat glands, our kidneys, you already know the adrenal medulla and the erector pili, the erector pili, this should say erector pili, not arrestor pili, um, muscle that makes our hair stand up, which tends to happen when we're really, really scared, realize that, another um, feature or a function of the sympathetic nervous system. So these structures only receive sympathetic fibers. Very important for you to be aware of the fact that your kidneys and most of your blood vessels only receive sympathetic fibers, especially for AMP2. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that when there is such a dual innervation, we find a dynamic antagonism between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, meaning if one increases contraction, the other one will tend to decrease contraction. If one increases secretion, the other one tends to decrease secretion. Finally, also in preparation of Anatomy and Physiology Part 2, where you will be discussing all the remaining organ systems, including the cardiovascular system, digestive, respiratory, excretory, reproductive systems, all of these are under control of the autonomic nervous system. And so it's important for you to understand these two forms of muscle tone that will be brought up many, many times during your class in AMP2. And that is sympathetic tone and parasympathetic tone. We've, we've mentioned muscle tone before. All of our muscles, whether they're skeletal, smooth, or, or um, cardiac muscle tissue, all of them express an ever so slightly contracted state, um, even when at rest. But in the case of the autonomic nervous system, sometimes that tone is really set by the sympathetic nervous system and other structures depend on, depend on the parasympathetic nervous system to create this kind of muscle tone. For instance, most of our blood vessels, as I said, most of our blood vessels are innervated by the sympathetic nervous system only. And they're going to be in this ever so slightly contracted state. And we refer to that as sympathetic tone, very often referred to better as vasomotor tone, vaso referring to blood vessels. And so if the sympathetic nervous system increases secretion of its neurotransmitters onto the, the smooth muscle of the blood vessels, we're going to see vasoconstriction, which, lead, which leads to an increase of blood pressure, while the opposite will lead to vasodilation and the blood pressure drops. So your sympathetic nervous system is very much in charge of regulating blood pressure. And under and at rest, it, all of our blood, press, blood vessels express something called sympathetic or vasomotor tone. Our heart, on the other hand, expresses parasympathetic tone, also called vagal tone for the vagus nerve who's in charge of it. 
And what that means is that your heart is always, with the help of the parasympathetic nervous system, slow down a little bit. You will learn in AMP2 that your heart has its own electrical conduction system. As a matter of fact, your heart doesn't need your autonomic nervous system at all in order to be depolarized and therefore contract. If we were to remove your heart from your chest and provide it with enough blood and oxygen and all that, it could theoretically keep beating on its own. And it would do this quite fast. So without innervation of the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system, our heart has its own fast heartbeat. And so to slow it down to where it's more effective to take care of our body, our parasympathetic fibers um, create what we call parasympathetic tone. So at rest, our heart experiences parasympathetic tone. When our heart rate needs to go up because we need to exercise or we need to fight for our lives, then the sympathetic fibers that also innervate our heart will secrete more neurotransmitters, which consequently will cause our heart to beat faster, contract be better, etc., etc. Now we see parasympathetic tone not just in the heart, but we also see it in other structures that are very much dependent on the parasympathetic nervous system to contract and secrete, such as your digestive and urinary structures. Please also read in your book about the impact of nicotine on blood pressure and your heart. And this wraps up our discussion of the autonomic nervous system.